by my count, that's two of yours and two of mine. I don't know how this ends, but I'd like it to. Um, or it can keep going. I just need my sister to be left out of this. That's why we're going to Pittsburgh, you dumb son of a bitch! Born in Virginia in 1976, Jeremy Saulnier is a relative newcomer to Hollywood, but in terms of a director's first handful of films, it's hard to beat Saulnier, who couldn't have come out of the gate much stronger. After making a few shorts called Goldfarb and Crab Walk, Saulnier made his first feature in 2007. Titled Murder Party, it's a surreal and cartoonishly violent indictment of art culture and America's relative indifference to violence. The film flew under the radar but has taken on cult status, especially since it was released on Netflix around Halloween to give everyone another chance to see it. What Murder Party lacked in polish, it made for in pluck, and Saulnier's sophomore effort, Blue Ruin, is exquisite. The 96% on Rotten Tomatoes, a number I'll only cite when it's high and I like the movie, sue me, seems well-deserved, and Ruin is a masterclass in tone, pacing, and plot revelation. Written and directed by Saulnier, and starring his partner in crime, Macon Blair, Ruin set the stage for his follow-up, 2015's Green Room. A taut and claustrophobic murder romp, Green Room chronicles a desperate fight for survival after a punk gig and a skinhead hangout goes south. Part of a raft of good offerings from A24 Studios lately, Green Room proved Blue Ruin was no fluke, and the follow-up, Netflix's Hold the Dark in 2018, was the first Saulnier feature he didn't write originally. It's adapted from a William Giraldi novel, and Macon Blair got the screenwriting credit but it seems like a fit for his style. All of his films feature lifelong friend Macon Blair, struck out on his own and wrote and directed 2017's I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore, a less serious but equally violent revenge caper. What's next for these two is anyone's guess. Blair is a capable writer having co-written the Saulnier film as well as 2013's The Monkey Paw. Saulnier recently directed a few episodes of True Detective. Whatever's next, fans are champing at the bit, and it will be even sweeter if it's a collaboration between the two. And welcome back to another episode of Director's Cut. This is our very first double director filmmaker feature. Tonight, we are talking about Jeremy Saulnier and Macon Blair. And tonight, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Jason Alts. Hey, everybody. Thanks for finding your way back. <laughs> <laughs> and also tonight, uh, making his way back from Bad Movie Night, we have Ian. Recently credited at a film festival it is, in fact, Ian Anderson. What? What? How whiskey drunk were they? Uh, they were busy watching too many shitty shorts through 600 short films and decide about 50 to show and a handful to uh, highlight. <laughs> so if they spelled my name wrong, I'll get the fuck over it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, either way, welcome back. It's six months, what was it been, about six months ago since uh, Hold the Dark was released on Netflix, and uh, you and Chris uh, did a, a kind of a shotgun review right after you watched the film. You even stated in the in the review that you wished you had some time to digest it. Now, you get that do-over. Six months later, we get to finally hear your, your thoughts on... Uh, on Hold the Dark. Yeah, it's a shame that we're watching it and talking about it immediately afterwards. Yeah, this is um, one I'd, I'd prefer to probably stew on a little bit. Stew on and probably watch again. I'm not sure how well this is going to hold up after I've had a chance to think about it some more. Yeah. Um, I was definitely looking for some, some more answers by the end of this film that I didn't get. I'm back, baby. And But before we do that, let's go around the table. I could already see Jason did uh, what we were supposed to. Jason and I were basically supposed to drink the same beer, and I screwed that up. Uh, so introduce your beer, Jason. We were supposed to drink. Th you didn't tell me that. Oh, well, Twitter thought we were supposed to. So Oh, well, we're as different as Jeremy Sonia and Macon Blair. Like, we're a good <laughs> collaboration, but we have our own individual tastes. Yeah. And I think pigeonholing the two of them is a mistake. Just a... Uh, just like not letting me drink my uh, orange chocolate dragon milks reserve from Ooh. their bourbon barrel age series. Yeah. Uh, I don't see. Maybe it's not. It's maybe it's just a reserve. No, it is bourbon barrel age. Yep, there you go. So dragon milk did like a uh, raspberry hibiscus and like a, an orange chocolate and just like a regular bourbon barrel age. Uh, so I, I've, I've, I'm drinking through all of those and they're all pretty fantastic. And it's 11 uh, percent. So uh, it doesn't mess around. New Holland Brewing in Michigan. Uh, which is coming to Battle Creek, which is a town where I grew up. So I'll be able to 
go to my old stomping grounds and uh, get some new Holland Dragon's Milk whenever I want. So it's uh, 11%. Um, this is going to be a, a podcast where I get considerably less articulate as we go on. Prost. I do believe that the last Fine. time I joined you guys for uh, for a discussion on uh, M. Night Shyamalan movies, you were also drinking a Dragon's Milk variant that night as well. Ooh. That beer always confuses me because I always think it's New Holland, Pennsylvania, which is right near where uh, Chris is from. But then it ends up being from Michigan and I get confused. So there's, there's room for all kinds of New Hollands. I was super excited when I saw the Dragon's Milk in uh, a Costco up here in the Seattle area. And so I wow. yeah, at nine dollars, I snatched it up. And then little did I know we were, we started carrying it in the, the place where I, I work in during the day. I mean, little alcohol. did you know, isn't it your job to stock it? <laughs> well, I don't work at Costco like. I was, oh, OK. Yeah. Where, where I where I actually work in, and sell liquor. Uh, that next day where I spent nine bucks, I saw them start carrying bombers of dragon's milk for like four forty nine. I'm like, how is this? This is crazy. Uh, so I, so I drank a bunch of that. That was fantastic today. Uh, I, I walked in and it's back up to like 11 bucks and I was uh. very sad. So, uh, long and short, uh, I am drinking a hop Valley divine shine. Uh, this is kind of the very antithesis of, uh, the dragon's milk, but it's a hybrid ale. So it's, Kind of a hef, uh, hef uh, kind of a pale ale, and kind of a Ooh. yeah, it's real, real bright, real uh, summery, uh, just to kind of bring in some some warmer weather. So, ah, yeah, very nice, uh, very refreshing, Ian. And unlike you, slackers, I have chosen a beer that is consistent with the topic of our episode tonight. I am drinking the Lancaster Brewing Company Winter Warmer Ale which is uh, got a nice big wolf there on the can and uh, benefits the wolf sanctuary of Pennsylvania because extinct is forever. Mm, very After nice. watching Hold the Dark, I don't think I want to preserve the wolf population. <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah. But after watching uh, Green Room, certainly we uh, can appreciate animals because... That pit bull, oh my God, brought a tear to my eye almost. Let's dive into these two filmmakers. These are, uh, you know, we, we've done people that are kind of low to the ground, like uh, Kevin Smith we talked about before. Ian was actually on that show. So we have discussed these kind of more indie focused, um, but you don't get more like kind of bootstrap filmmakers that, than Jeremy Saunier and Macon Blair. And it's almost to a point, maybe Macon Blair still, hasn't re you know he has one under his belt a, a very good one which we'll get into but jeremy kind of has a a pedigree now that he's been building and he's been building this good credit and to what i've seen like kind of diving into uh some of these interviews and and just hearing him speak he's had some opportunities but he's still not quite ready to to go to the dark side so to speak and hop into those studio films I don't want to say that Macon drafted off of Jeremy a little bit, but I will say he didn't go through what Jeremy Saulnier had to go through uh, when he made uh, um, I Don't Feel at Home in This World Anymore. He didn't have the difficulties and he didn't have to basically wager everything on the movie. Uh, but I, I I think he was still on his own to an extent and he had to he had to go to to uh, Sundance, get it sold, and Netflix luckily picked it up. But it was possible nobody would ever see the movie. But to get Blue Ruin made, my God, Sonia said he he and his wife cashed in their 401k, their retirement savings, they maxed out their credit cards, and they still had to go to Kickstarter to get money for payroll. Like, if that movie hadn't worked out, you know, well, he would have gone back to his day job, which was in Hollywood, and you know, it's still pretty lucrative. But, like, they, they risked a lot. In regards to that charge you brought up, though, didn't make... Uh, I would say that these guys both uh, neither drafted off the other, but they definitely buoyed each other. You know, I'd be curious to know what both Certainly. of their careers would look like if they if they hadn't connected, because, you know, how many obstacles would they have run into and not had that person there to help them over the line? Like Blue Ruin, if you don't have an actor like Macon Blair in that role, if they're not up to it, that whole movie falls the fuck well, apart. He he basically told everybody else they could shoot for like, uh, you know, 15 days or something like that. And he's like, sorry, bacon, you're in for the long haul. He needed someone he could abuse, yeah. right? That like he used the word abuse. Yeah. Somebody he could be like, look, you're just going to have to work 18 hour days for six months. And that's just, that's the yeah. thing. If it hadn't been but his best you... friend, I don't know who he would have like, uh, who was, I think, uh, Soderbergh said he wouldn't have, he, he put himself in a movie because he couldn't 
bear to put anybody else through. Oh, for put Skizopolis? Through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, hear that. I don't think he could have or would have wanted to make Blue Ruin without making Blair, certainly. That, that, that's a fair point. But if he, if he was trying to push that forward and, you know, bank everything on the movie and have somebody who was fine, but not up to that level, then... We probably don't see a second feature film. Kind of a featurette for for Murder Party, which is Sonya's first credited, you know, d- directorial debut. Basically, you mentioned uh, Crab Crab Crawl or whatever. First feature, but, though. Yeah, the the first yeah. feature, Goldfarb and uh, Crab Death, Walk. Yeah, uh, but but Murder for all intents and purposes, Murder Party was there was his, first. and even even the cast and crew and and everyone the, the the main character he was the producer of it, and that was they all grew up in this kind of like broken lizard esque group of not necessarily comedians, but they were all obsessed with uh, Coen brothers and Michael Mann films and making squibs when they were in sixth grade, like just, just kids in the backyards of of Virginia, you know, making these, uh, these effects in these films. And uh, all of them resoundingly said in that, in that uh, murder party featurette that Jeremy, when he left for, for uh, film school, he came back and like a completely different person. Like he got it. Everyone could tell that the light came on for him. And even Macon Blair was saying this. So I think there is some validity to what you're saying, Jay, where it's, uh, yes, Macon Blair is a very, very talented filmmaker and, and of course actor. But I think that everyone, it all started with Jeremy Sonia kind of taking that next step from, from backyard filmmaking to, to actual filmmaking. Glad you brought up Broken Lizard because I've been thinking about that group a lot lately actually i wonder why there aren't more groups for filmmaking that way like even for other genres because like uh lately i've gotten into a little bit of very short filmmaking probably more along the lines of crab walk but like more dramatic stuff lately some of my friends at bad movie night and uh i've been thinking about that exact comparison that's and seeing jeremy saulnier and macon blair and chris sharp and some of the other folks that have been involved with uh what's it called the lab of madness Mm -hmm. That's kind of the path they took. So it's I've I found diving into his work very inspiring. I think Jay is very clearly the leader of Broken Lizard, and I don't know how that kind of happened, but he's sort of the adult. Everyone else mm-hmm. just wants to dick around. <laughs> he wants to point the camera. So I, I think if you don't have that dynamic where you got you know too many chiefs and enough Indians, uh, you might have run into a problem with like ego feuding and stuff like that, where you're pulling in different directions. I think what broken lizard does well is uh, everybody else is free to just goof around. And then Jay's the adult and he still likes to, you know, to, to riff. He's still just as funny as the rest of them. But like, for whatever reason, he's fine with that mantle. And if you have people vying for it, it can get uh, a little testy, but if you Fair have enough. one person that just emerges as a leader, um, which I think that's kind of what Jeremy did because uh, they made that uh, that movie when they were all like 12 years old and he sort of just stepped in. He's like, no, here's how you make better squibs and stuff like that. So yeah, out uh, of the fireworks and the lady fingers and yeah. Yeah. Not when they were 12. I think he said that when they were, when he, they were like 15 <laughs> or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he was always the one that's sort of like, you guys are the creatives, but I will do the mechanical work of making a good film. And uh, I think that's really important too. Well, some of them were happy with staying in that backyard. Like the guy that plays uh, Alexander uh, or or Tim in in Murder Party. Like if you saw his interview, he's he's a mess, and that's they're all like, yeah, that's really him. He's they had to like chase him around to to nail his ass down to the the floor to do his scenes correctly and his lines correctly. He is someone you have to harness. An actor, no. Personality, yes. He's the most inconsistent piece of shit. You have to like fondle him the whole time he's you know delivering his lines or else he'll get bored and go running or something maybe next time we can have trailers my brushes would be scattered out and then i would and i would you know what the hell what is this and sandy would say guess one guess which one was in my butt what i'm going to give paul is something i've a little something i've devised called the hairy banana daiquiri i'm the type of guy that's gonna put a couple of eggs on this bagel and I'm the type of guy that's gonna eat this motherfucking bacon. I just try and try and do it the Dennis Quaid way most most days. Sometimes I do it the David Caruso way. Just bringing it the James Wood style. Sometimes I do it the Tom Arnold way. Just doing it the Sandy Barnett way. It's the only way I know how. So I think some of them were just like, yeah, I, I, this is just fun for now. And that was a resource that I think he used. He was so comfortable with the this group of of individuals. And then when he's like, well, shit's gonna get real. The 
the kind of the cream or the people that wanted to pursue it further in in Jeremy and Macon, I think that's why those two have stuck together so well and, and collaborated so well. Sometimes there's a Pete Best, right? Yeah. There's some of them like, I don't, I don't want this life, you know? <laughs> I don't want your life. Your life. Yeah. <laughs> Only in a Liverpool accent. <laughs> Sometimes someone's just like, I don't, I'm not trying to do this. I'm just, I, I like when we were dicking around in the backyard shooting Murder Cop or whatever that movie yeah. was called. Yeah. He still wants to make a Murder Cop 2000. So that'd be cool. Be on the lookout. He and his wife, they kind of mortgaged their future, uh, cashed in their future and said, you know, I'm about to turn 30. I'm about to have my third child. I'm going to give it one more go. And thank God that that turned out well. And, you know, we don't usually kind of work up the ladder, but maybe it's, maybe it's kind of warranted in, you know, necessarily to see the growth of, of someone that like, like him that, you know, this, this backyard individual going to like a full fledged director, um, you know, making blue ruin with, you know, like you said, Ian with someone that like making Blair was his muse. And I, and I just wonder, like, it's so odd, right? Like you hear a lot of creators be like, you know, this person's my muse or this was, but, Macon Blair, you look at him, he's, he's just like a, a mix between like Paul Giamatti and like a, a Zach Galifianakis. It's like he, he's kind of an unlikely muse, but he is just so goddamn talented. And, I, and I'm glad that they kind of found each other and, and made this film. I doubt that muse is kind of a fair thing to say, because that kind of it just implies that, you know, he kind of channels his work through him. But like, I feel like they're much more collaborators and in the Broken Lizard kind of a way. I'm sure they're working on things together and just one guy happens to, you know, at the end of the day, have the director role and, you know, get the final say, but. Well, you know, what's funny. Um, I, I kind of think that they did begin to diverge, I think a bit when they got successful and they would still be happy to work together. But creatively, if you look at the stuff Jeremy Saulnier is doing, um, it's a little, it's pulling away from murder party. If you look at that as yeah. a starting point, because, uh, you know, I don't feel at home in this world anymore is so similar to murder potty party or to potty. The potty <laughs> that eats people. <laughs> I, mean, I don't feel at home is so similar in tone and in comedic sensibility to murder party. You, you kind of, you kind of think uh, Jeremy Sonia wants to make these gut punch movies that sort of have a message and tell a story and make you really feel all the deaths. Whereas I don't feel at home. All the deaths were cartoonish and didn't re weren't that sad or affecting and that's fine too because i like the movie so it, it feels like the more they diverge the more you'll sort of get the you know they'll you'll understand what their like mo true motivation is and, and what they the kind of stories they want to tell but i think I, I think they but if you put the two together you get something like murder party which didn't do well but was fun to watch mm -hmm. i think jeremy saulnier has definitely demonstrated if anything and it an interest in making a diverse style of movies. Like anytime somebody wants to pigeonhole him, he moves in a different direction. So I would be surprised if you see a, a more comedic take in the future. That's not him. Though. Well, at least that's not what he, he said. I, I could never write comedy. I never want to write comedy. It just, mm -hmm. if, if the absurdity or whatever happens to be funny, then that's the way to do it. Where I can see, uh, Conversely, I can't see making Blair comedic focused films. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and I and Sonya did say that that Macon was his muse. That he he writes, he scripted uh, uh, Dwight for for Blue Ruin with Macon Blair in mind, and and, yeah. and and took his his mannerism his mannerism the sensibilities. Yes, he even also said that Macon's a very kind hearted person. So he even had problems with some of the decisions that he had to make during the film. But he also uh, he he made the the character with with very much him in mind, and the same one with uh, uh, Gabe uh, in in Green Room. So. Green Room. There's certainly not. It's certainly a pretty serious movie, but there are some very light, humorous moments in sure. that that aren't certainly not to the level of Murder Party as a whole, but it has those moments. Yeah, I, I think you're laughing at the you're laughing because you're uncomfortable. You're laughing. at It's like a laugh where you're and Jason, you've said this before. It's a it's little like, bit of relief of tension. Yeah. But, yeah. The, but he kept the tension ratcheted for the most part in green. And I think it would have been intolerable if there hadn't been a little bit of semi comic relief. Yeah. 
Potentially. Or just just like a little bit of just a little bit of lightening of the tension because I, I think if he'd ratcheted it up too much, the movie would have been too hard to watch. But because think, it was yeah. it was claustrophobic and it was sure. tense and uh, it was really dark in tone and it was it, it was suspenseful to watch. But there are definitely laugh out loud moments in that movie too. Uh, in particular, the final line of that movie just is a gut mm-hmm. gut buster. Uh, and there's just a moment where Macon Blair is just power washing and there's nothing comedic inherent in the way it was written, but just the timing and the pacing of it. He's just in there power washing while awful things are happening unbeknownst to him. And it's just and like, that's, that's sort of like a laugh. comedic trope. Like, like there's two people fighting in a room and then you see somebody vacuuming yeah. with headphones on and they don't <laughs> notice that there's a, a fight going on in the background. <laughs> yeah. He would just, he'd hit like completely oblivious to the, mm-hmm. to the, to what was going on. I, I, I liked uh, I liked a little bit of that tension relief, but maybe not too much of that. Fair enough. Um, I, I think I think putting Macon in the setting of Blue Ruin made the movie what it was because he couldn't really see Macon being a cold blooded killer. He would have right. screwed yeah. up. He would have missed the guy three yards away in the trunk. You know, <laughs> he would have missed the people point blank with the the shotgun even after getting a little training he would have cut his stupid hand trying to cut the tires he would have made all those mistakes leaving his his car registration in the glove box at the scene of the crime and leaving his his you know dog tags Parties, yeah <laughs> yeah like all that stuff you know so I, um i think that certainly speaks to jeremy saulnier's style quite a bit like especially yeah. with his first three features which he at one time called his inept protagonist trilogy mm-hmm. uh, where just, yeah, you've got these, these lead characters who just, they're put in these situations where they have to fall back on skills that maybe they've seen in movies or TV, but they just don't have themselves. So, you know, they're trying hard to overcome these extreme situations they've been thrown into and the authenticity that adds to their characters is, is, is pretty delightful. We can use that uh, in, I don't feel at home too. Yeah. They were both of them. uh, They were both idiots. They were both totally inept. And that's why I think that movie feels in keeping with those first three Jeremy Saulnier's movies. Yeah. More than hold the dark does though. Certainly you can see his fingerprints all over that too. It's just, well, it wasn't an original uh, story. It was moving. something like tonally, this is the movie I want to make, but like I'm not mm-hmm. going to start from scratch. I'm going to adapt the novel. I'm going to have Macon do the writing yeah. on it. Which there's I, also an attempt to do something a bit different. Yeah, which was it was it was successful. I I thought they executed very well. Tonally, a little different, but like it I was. Think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's gotten a lot of flack for the ineptitude of uh, his, his protagonist or, or even the, the antagonist, oh. even, even with the not. Yeah. I, I think that a lot of movie goers go in there go, Oh, why are they, these, these people are so dumb. They're reacting so stupid, but why is not John wick? Yeah, exactly. It's just like, because not everyone's a Mary oh. Sue, because if you're, if you're a, a kind hearted, kind hearted person inherently like Dwight and you're on a murder spree. Yeah. You're, you're, you're just not trained to, want to do these things so you're gonna fumble and you're gonna fuck up when you're when you have this heightened sense of of terror around you especially in in green room i thought everyone was extremely authentic with with their reactions on both sides of the door i think that it was he is the best at shooting cluster fucks and i think that is uh, it's definitely on purpose uh that's his word see i can't I can't imagine people giving him flack for these types of characters. You can't imagine. I really can't. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's because I don't. Yeah, maybe it's because I don't pay it. No, I don't. Have pay you seen the comments on anything about a Star Wars movie or like? You can't imagine. Oh no, I do my best to avoid that. Oh John well, Hides, um, Star Wars shirt. There yeah. are lots of different opinions about everything <laughs> out there, and a lot of them are really, really stupid, man. Because people don't always get. No, it. no. You're correct. I just feel like a lot of his movies have flown at least enough under because they're not Star Wars. Not everybody's watching uh, Jeremy Saulnay and Macon Blair movies. You have to go out and see just, them, or you have but to if see they them were out. more, yeah. if they were more accessible to like, dipshits, like authenticity it. is what I think has made some of his movies such. Like the people who like the, his films love yeah. his films, and the people who don't like watch one and then fuck off, and you probably don't catch the rest. Well, that's that's know. why they're I not just, doing better. You know, that's that's why they but, weren't like huge mega smashes because enough people saw they're I, like why would the guy give the guy in the trunk the gun? I don't get it. Like, you know, like it's a little too realistic. And I think 
there's a certain segment of the population that wanted Bumblebee and didn't get it. So, you know, mm-hmm. they wanted it. See, I don't, I don't think enough people have seen the movie to even have that opinion. Just because the way it was distributed, it, you know, it lends itself to people who go to film festivals and catch up on the latest things. And, you know, the types of people who only see Star Wars and Marvel films probably haven't even seen it. Well, because it's more hipster to say, I don't like this really good, well-made indie film. You know, it's just like, uh, I'm going to be the guy that's no, so green no, no, and bad. No. Blah, blah, blah. More hipster to say, I liked him before he was cool. Yeah. <laughs> Doing I thought Murder Party, Party was his best. I, that does. I I, uh, I think Reservoir Dogs is my favorite Tarantino movie, and I will fight people over that. So maybe we all got I, a little bit of that in us, you know have no interest in arguing you on this point <laughs> there you go i win so that's why i had that opinion you don't want to fight me i really like hateful eight but reservoir dogs is probably the best yeah i'm not yeah you're right it's um, fine it's fine another thing that that people were complaining about of course is you know for the uninitiated is the gore um where he oh. is just uh what a breath of fresh air as far as uh, yes. uh, just someone that could shoot not only brutality but how to shoot it and shoot the action to go with it like we we've seen these like in his films uh you know it's always sudden and it's always this big uh, ex- like literal explosion of, of of gore and it's very jarring because it's like it goes from zero to to 400 and you have no yeah. warm-up time or anything it's it's you're sitting there watching you know exposition and then half someone's fucking jaws sitting on the floor to paraphrase him he said if you kill ten thousand people no one gives a shit but if you kill one person, it's a gut punch. Yeah, like right. what? What was more affecting? Like a scene in like Dunkirk where a plane just like strafes a bunch of people and they all go down, or like seeing Anton Yelchin's wrist when he pulled it back in the green room after mm. trying to hand the gun out. At some point in the story, I poured a large scotch. Pick us this script. It was so unsettling. You can individualize ultra violence if it happens to one person, and it feels more affecting because you start to see yourself as the protagonist and then something like that happens and you're like oh you know this is really but if like uh, uh, people just get wiped out in waves it sort of like has a numbing effect and you don't sure. really think about any of one of those people's like oh shit that person had hopes and dreams you know and they just got taken out in a, in a second you really think about wow I, I watched this whole guy's progression through the movie where he you know siphoning gas and sleeping on couches and staying off of social media because that's how he wants to live his dream authentically. And now, you know, he's fighting for his life. That's a lot more affecting. He, he wants that gut punch. He wants you to understand how precious life is and how jarring it should be when something violent happens to someone. He's not doing it gratuitously. He's, but he is doing it over the top. So you understand the shit has import. I think that's one of the things I like so much about his films because it contrasts so distinctly from what you're used to from Hollywood films where if there's going to be a guy who gets shot in the face, if they're going to drag it out for a minute, there's going to be a standoff. They're going to talk about it. They're going to threaten. I'm going to shoot you. No, you're not. I'm going to shoot you. And it takes forever. But you have a character who's standing there like mid sentence and all of a sudden they're fucking gone. And that suddenness, especially because he so intentionally paces his movies that like, he makes the choice to slow things down or speed things up and just the, 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 the drastic changes in pace to his movies are so intentional and, and so drives the tone that that's one of the things I really love about both, both these guys films. We could do a whole episode just on pacing. Yeah. Because for, for a guy who's made, let's be real, like four actual movies. Mm -hmm. Does anybody really reveal the plot to the audience as deliberately explained as little, you know, didn't do flashbacks, just you start Blue Ruin basically at the end of the movie. We never see his parents. Of course, of this guy's the Yeah. All those years ago, you don't even find out it's the parents that died until like 10 minutes into the movie. You don't find out who really killed him till the very end, you know, Mm -hmm. and he could show you that he could do some dumb exposition with dialogue but like if you're in the trunk of the car you're not gonna be like i was the one who killed your parents or whatever like you would say you you wouldn't say to anything that stuff that anything to that guy he already knew so the Mm -hmm. way he does exposition dialogue is like you still have to catch up he reveals the plot in in such a an interesting way and he's he's such a good writer 
on top of being like a, a, a talented director, I, I really I think that the way he chooses to, to what he shows, it's very deliberate. He gives you just enough information and doesn't bludgeon you with anything. And yeah. I think you spend part of the movie confused and that's fine because you're, he's, I think you're just looking at what's happening. He doesn't tell you. He shows you. Another distinctive feature of Jeremy Saulnier films is that he doesn't particularly care about telling you what the character motivations are and what they're thinking. It's just important that the character knows what their motivations are. And if it comes, it hopefully comes across to you enough that you can figure it out, but he's not gonna, you know, literally like have a character turn to the camera and dialogue explain. And, you know, (laughs) Explain to you, hey, it's like, me. I'm sleeping in a car and eating uh, yeah. trash cans on the boardwalk. You probably wonder how I got here. <laughs> yeah, I think twenty years earlier. Ferris, <laughs> I think the Ferris Bueller or the Deadpool, like break the fourth wall and talk directly to the audience, would be like the absolute biggest sellout in Jeremy Saulnier's eyes. Like that is the one thing that he could never abide doing. Meanwhile, if nobody talks guess. for the first five minutes of Blue Ruin. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> nobody says a word of dialogue for easily five minutes yeah. does he say anything until yeah. the diner scene with his sister like yeah he talks to the cop he, does. he talks okay. to the cop okay yeah it, it's going back to the violence real quick it's the the violence is almost a attention release uh because like you guys said he is so good at just slow cooking you feel like you're in a in a crock pot the entire time you're watching his films and it's so uncomfortable but you cannot you there's i didn't even know my cell phone like cell phones existed while i'm watching mm-hmm. blue ruin or or uh, a green room and that's saying a lot watching a lot of films as much as we do in prep for these like a normal movie i'm like oh, i'm checking the time i'm doing this doing that i couldn't like do anything else but watch these films and i think that also he doesn't make his characters like like especially like the punk band in uh in in green room i think that he stripped down the kind of yeah okay we we know that they're that they're just this group and they just kind of go around they siphon gas they, they're kind of living this like early 20s dream like right you know they could have gone to college but they might be taking a a, a year off to go have this like final hurrah and, and and just live like schmucks um but i think that he he doesn't flesh out his characters a little bit uh or more because i think he wants it's easier to transport yourself into those pressure cooker situations like you felt like you were in that goddamn room uh in the green room with them because it's not like you're it's not, you know, one guy out of nowhere is, is putting a, an arm bar on, on this guy that's like twice his size, but there was no like exposition moment where it's like, hey, I'm a karate master. I do mar- mixed martial arts. It just, who cares? Like, okay, this guy has this skill and he could do it. Anton Yelchin's kind of the the philosopher of the group, but there's it's not fleshed out in a way which usually would bother me in other films, but in his films, when it's just about the situation and and overcoming what's happening to you, it it's more effective, and you could put yourself in those in those shoes easier. If there's no way to tell you that information, you probably don't need to know it. If there's another yeah. way to get the point across, or if it's something you can skip, you pissed off when he just like threw threw the guy in the armbar, or were you just like, "Yep, that guy could do that." Um. I think if you can get that guy into that position, even though he's bigger, he can't get out of it. I mean, maybe getting him into that position could be tough in an actual fight, but he wasn't expecting it. Once you're in it, you can't get out. If so. it had been ridiculous, they would have done something else. He would have just written yeah. something else. Because the way he 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 said, I just wrote, and if someone would have done something dumb or made a mistake, they had to die. And like he said that kind of bothered him. He would be like, oh, that person died. And I got to to walk away from the script and walk back. So it's sort of like he felt like he just worked the story through and what the story demanded to happen, he wrote in, as opposed to knowing how things are going to end. And uh, that's sort of a weird way to to write, but I think Stephen King says he writes the same way, Mm -hmm. which is why his books are of an unpredictable length. He just sort of writes until like the plot demands what happens next. So I I think that that comes across in Green Room where where someone's like, well, look, if they go outside thinking they're safe and there's a bunch of people with dogs waiting, they're not all going to get away. And yeah. how someone who's never leveled a shotgun before, are they going to be able to expertly hit 
a dog running at them at full speed when they're scared, their hands are shaking. They've never fired a gun. What's the realistic thing for it for, to happen here? She drops to one knee, takes out like three dogs, and the, does a combat roll inside. No, she's probably done for. And I, yeah, and any I, other movie I like she that realism. Survived. Yeah, absolutely. And, he and didn't kill people in a specific I... order based on like tropes or anything. It was just sort of like the story demands something happens here. And that is one of the things I like so much about Saul Nye movies is that authenticity added by what feel like real world characters. Like they're still thrown into absolutely batshit situations that we just never find ourselves in in our everyday lives. But this is what it would look like if we did. <laughs> and if they get out alive, it's through sheer luck. Peg the guy in the chest with a rock and he falls down and gets bit by yeah. a snake. Sheer luck. <laughs> well, and, and in the case of Green Room, it's because the Nazis are as inept, uh, much to Patrick Stewart's dismay. He's like the one person that's kind of figured out, but he just has these like backyard idiots that are that well, are his, you know, army. You can't just go in there and shoot them though, because they had the the beware a dog sign yeah. instead of a song a sign that said no trespassing. So like, well, we can't say that we shot them. We we gotta say that the dogs got them because they were siphoning gas. And they never said that. That was all through mm -hmm. dramatic irony. And yeah. until the, the very end of the movie, when it wraps up, when you finally see what they're staging, you realize, oh, they couldn't just charge in their guns blazing until it's like, you know what? Screw it. Just pull the slugs out. We'll, we'll just go shoot them. Because, because, like, you know, at first it was sort of like, well, what if we trick them into coming outside and the dogs get them? And then the more shit went south, they're like, all right, fuck it. This isn't perfect, but we can probably still get away with it. <laughs> so it's not that, like, the Nazis were in that per se. It was just like, they had a well laid plan and it kept they kept having to improvise because these people were a little pluckier and got out of the situation a little better than they expected. Yeah. And I think that's great writing too. dramatic irony, you know, to as exposition. I, I think it's uh, it's good writing. I think it's clear that uh, characters in Jeremy saw movies are very reactive. Yes. Very, very much reacting to what's directly in front of them and everything is a surprise to them. <laughs> yeah. We're kind of talking about uh, Blue Ruin and Green Room a lot more than the other mm -hmm. ones. And I think that I, they seem better I think to most me. That's true of Murder Party as well, though. Well, Murder Party just it, it felt it, it lacked polish. It was just like a fun cult film. And yeah. it was a little bit more message heavy. It was sort of like, but, oh, here's an indictment of how goofy art culture is and how yeah, Americans sort of trivialize violence and don't really, you know, care that, about it. When a guy shows up covered in blood, everyone's like, "Cool, they're doing an installation piece." You know? <laughs> See that the, it, there was good bones under the the kind of silly. Uh, yeah. absurdness of it though you could see sure. that we actually had a foundation of a filmmaker that could go on to do great stuff because as as crazy and madcap and and silly as that movie is it is still really it, it's brilliantly written um it, it's it's very funny um so you, yes it, it's kind of the most like throwaway of all of them but it's still, like I said, you know, the, the bones are there. I, before we, we move on from like Green Room and, and Blue Ruin so much is uh, I think that Green Room is kind of the, the true sequel to oh. Precinct 13 was where I thought I, I got it with Red State. Red State. I, I thought Red State. It's kind of it's that it's that uh, that tower defense siege kind movie. of thing. Yeah. Siege movie. Yeah. Thank you. Um, where. Yeah. Then after watching that and I'm just like, oh, man, yeah, this this is the. The true bloodline so you could really see jeremy saunier's his inspirations in all these it were even in blue and ruin you know, that, that felt like is uh, no country for old men and you know what's really interesting is that john carpenter so feels like an inspiration in all of jeremy saunier's movies but he actually i did listen to an interview with him this week and he did not see assault on precinct 13 before he wrote green room though he did see it before he shot it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, it it felt it very much felt like a blood relative to like an updated version, but but one that he could use his experience in the the hardcore and punk rock scene, uh, where you know, like he said, Nazis were were kind of low hanging fruit as far as bad guys go. But he even mm -hmm. lived those experiences in the yeah. in the Washington D.C. scene where he was he got the shit kicked out of him by a skinhead, didn't even know why. Uh, yeah. and, because he was in a band or whatever, and so he used that that knowledge to kind of you know, frame uh, like a like a really well made siege movie with with a more kind of updated and personal uh, aesthetics. 
the timing of the release of Green Ruin is kind of fascinating in and of itself, too, because it was like one minute before Nazis had their heyday, too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, he addressed that in an interview. He was like, I wish that I hadn't done all this research to see how Nazis talked and heard all of it mirrored. It's It was kind of perfect timing for that movie to come out, too, though. Which he hated it for. He hated answering questions about that when it came out. And he yeah. like, he's like, now I, yeah, of course, you know, you have to, you have to make those comparisons. And he's like, it is kind of, kind of weird and gross that how, how truthful that, that film does kind of lend itself to being, but I would disagree with Jeremy Saulnier in that case then, though, because okay. I think it was so important for all of us to see that and not just have it be some dumb caricature the way, you know, some films or news outlets or whatever would have us see them as because if you don't understand it you can't address it you know what i mean and not that green room is not a political statement in any way right like the, the nazis are the bad guys so in that sense you know i guess you're saying that nazis are bad but like come on that's not a political statement but he was challenging anyway. himself in an interview mm -hmm. he said nazis are prepackaged villains that's how he phrased it yeah. prepackaged villains so it was important to make them three dimensional and give them humanity and show their motivation versus being like Nazis bad. They're goose stepping around and oh, they're going to kill them because they're just being Nazis all the time. Yeah, but he didn't make them caricatures either, though. No, he just he made them like, what is why would they act the way they're acting? Well, they're just trying to yeah. keep from getting jammed up by the cops. You know, they're like, hey, yeah. I, one of our dudes did something stupid. What do we do now? Well, let's get the cops off our back and by having the kids stab each other and then let's well how do we how do we get rid of these people that saw too much well we'll we'll figure out a way versus just going in there spraying them with bullets or whatever you know or stabbing them in the side of the head like and the all, one idiot did you could tell patrick stewart's character was sort of like i'm a businessman you know this my recruiting tool is this ideology it's this punk music and then you sort of use punk music to transition people into this. Well, this is your identity, you know, racial purity, that sort of thing. But it's all really just <laughs> to get foot soldiers to to run as dope, you know, <laughs> and you really got the sense of that. It's like as much as it is like this awful ideology, it's just something that someone's using to trick dipshits into doing his dirty work. And yeah, that was important to express too, to show and dupes basically all of all of that adds so much authenticity to the piece and to me that is like the number one thing about Saulnier's work that really draws me to it and it's the reason why i will probably go see every jeremy Saulnier movie that ever comes out like if you tell me ian there's a movie coming out tomorrow night from jeremy Saulnier, i'm gonna go see it you don't even have to tell me the title and i'll go fucking see it because like that authenticity is there and i've I've dabbled around the edges of like the punk and hardcore scenes. I'm, I'm not active in it now by any stretch. I'm too old for that shit, but uh, like just green room is so authentic, both in the way it portrays like punk music and like the gigging It gets all of that so well. And it's, it doesn't go out of its way to prove Nazis are bad. Cause why do you need to prove Nazis are bad? That's, I mean, I wish that were less political of a statement than it was now. And it wasn't at the time it was not released, really. No, it was, it was just sort of like, Hey, was remember like, Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, Did you it was know like they still kind of sort of exist? Yeah. It was like 30 seconds before yeah. Nazis are bad was a political statement. So Jeremy Sonny is what, and, what you're saying. You he's a prophet. A yeah. Like, can you punch a Nazi was like six months after the release of that movie. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know the exact date. Don't, don't, don't at me, but, uh, <laughs> But so, it was close. <laughs> so can we talk a little bit about what Sonya does technically well as a cin cinematographer and director? Because I I feel like I did a ton of research on that, too. And I think that's worth discussing just because, no. like, look, he came out of film school. Right. And then <laughs> his day job is as a cinematographer, which I think is perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, like, Mike Judge's day job was like engineering. He worked for, like, I think Lockheed Martin or something like that or Boeing. You know, like when when somebody makes a movie when they don't really know what they're doing. Sometimes it's a little bit sloppier, but his movies were so technically good because like, he's like, well, if blue ruin doesn't work out, I'm cashed in my 401k and that sucks, but I'm just going to go back to being a center for cinematographer working on music videos, just doing that kind of, there's so many people in Hollywood that aren't making feature films that are working, you know, that have the skills. There's, there's some dude that like is a key grip that has only ever worked on commercials for breakfast cereal. 
and probably so, drives a Maserati. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the, I, I'm not saying like, oh, he would have been successful because I think he would have felt like a failure. But at the same time, right. his day job was just being in the thick of it. And I, I think that's that shows because you're like, how if you look at Murder Party, which is sort of like something we could have shot in college versus Blue Ruin, you're like, how is this so polished? How is this the same person? This is really yeah. the guy's first real movie. How right. is it? How does it look this good? Well, that's all he did the whole time since he was 12 was point a camera. He knew what lenses he needed to get. You know, he knew what he, I, I saw of an interview by accident that had like nothing to do with. He was just talking tech. He's like, oh, about the Canon 3200. And I'm like, I don't know any of this stuff. But he's like, I wanted something that swapped in lenses real fast. Right, like, right. Yeah. He knew everything he wanted technically on his first real movie because that was all he that was just his job. Because he know? was already an innovator. So he just needed to go to film school to to learn how to hone this kind of raw talent. I, I Yeah, he needed to learn how to direct, but he knew how to be a cinematographer. So he mm -hmm. spent so much time being a cinematographer. He's like, I need somebody else to just do the technical aspects of it so I can actually give notes because he was doing so much with lenses and shit that he forgot the notes he had for the actors. He's just sort of like, uh, <laughs> just do another take and I hope you nail it. <laughs> like he he realized he needed somebody to help him out. So he was doing so much camera pointing because he said, I can't divorce myself from camera pointing as a director. And mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you just need to get away from the camera and look at a monitor and wear some headphones and let somebody else point your goddamn camera for you because like that's their job. And uh, I, I think it was interesting that making Blair um, learn from that and just use a, a, an experienced cinematographer on his first movie. He mm -hmm. used uh, Larkin Seipel, who did the uh, cinematography on um, uh, Swiss Army Man. So he mm -hmm. was already a guy okay. who like could could do all that stuff. So he could just be like, look, I have a vision for this. You know, can you just make it look good and I'll go direct it? And I, I think uh, I think it's important to have a good crew like that. But I, I think it's important that Sony realized he was doing too much of that and backed off. Yeah. So uh, I think it really something like Blue Run that's just so polished for like honestly his first movie um it, it really just shows how he was really destined to just work in that kind of thing he is very underrated as far as a light like being able to do lighting well uh he i mean i would I, put him up i think that concept is underrated i don't think most people care about that but i think anyone that does is gives him props for sure it's just so clean it, in, in all of his film. I'm saying Blue Ruin, yeah. uh, Green Room, and uh, and Hold the Dark. I mean, it is just everything is lit perfectly. Like it just everything looks cinematic, even though we're we're all set in one room or a trunk of a car or uh, a little like cave in, in a cabin. It, it just everything is exactly like precisionly shot. It changed all throughout Blue Ruin. If mm -hmm. you look at the beginning, everything's cool and blue and it's low light and a lot of right. filters that get rid of all the yellow lights. So everything looks blue. He's looking out the water and then everything gets darker. Yep. The tones get warmer. He stops wearing a blue shirt and starts wearing a brown shirt. Just like everything gets a little earthier and grittier mm -hmm. as the movie goes on. And somebody said in an interview that they noticed that he's like that, like out of everything that people attributed to me, that's the one thing I feel like I did on purpose. So not only did he nail natural lighting, he nailed the natural lighting gradient between the film as it shifted tonally. That's for your first film. That's so ambitious. Yeah. Now going back in a couple steps to murder party and the unpolished nature of it. I think that's what I loved about that one so much too, though, because there's no way a polished version of murder party works sure. even a little bit. Like if he had just wrote yeah. a script and passed it off to whatever was the, director of that type of movie of the time and they knew how to light it and like color it Roth or something setting sure that would have been an awful fucking movie <laughs> <laughs> like the unpolished nature of that worked so well for the story that was being told like i don't want jeremy saulnier to make murder party in 2019 2020 you know like that would be a terrible fucking movie he shouldn't keep trying to make murder party precisionly shot like if you if you watch I think he would disagree with you based on some interviews i've heard with no, him. Uh, and, and i get that i mean of course because he i mean if he you still learning 
Yeah, if you it's, listen to it anything, was perfect for what the story was. He though. he never he always says he's like I, I didn't even think I was a real director until Hold the Dark. He's just like there's so many times where I I am the best actor out of everyone because I have fooled you all to to thinking that I know what the hell I'm doing. He is very uh, humble, but I but not in like a smart like a douchey way he is really humble because he's just like happy to be there he thought it was the funniest thing uh he got the kicks out of watching his his best childhood friend and macon blair uh you know walk down the gravel driveway with patrick stewart like he is like so in the moment and so appreciative and someone like him that that literally uh sold off his future he and his wife and his family's future and, and took time away from his kids and all this stuff and that actually like meant something to him uh and that's why his films especially something like blue ruin looked like it it was made by someone that it, it couldn't have been made by anyone else because that person had so much invested in it personally and like it was an all-in movie and, and like like you said at the top uh if that doesn't work we don't get green room. We don't, we don't get hold the dark. Maybe Macon Blair doesn't make, you know, I don't feel at home in this world. Um, just so good. It just put everything into motion. And the fact that that sparked everything and still is, in my opinion, his best film just speaks like eons to, to the right. talent. Well, he's which humble one, because he knows. I think Blue Ruin Ruin for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I agree. Interesting. Interesting. He's um he's he's so humble because he knows enough about making movies from his work as a cinematographer. Making movies, I see what you ah. did there. Ah. <laughs> he knows enough to know how little he knows. Like I'm most sorry, people, I'm when they know like ten percent about making a movie, they're like, ah, I'm so good at this because they haven't hit the Dunning Kruger curve, right? But like he he knows exactly how much he doesn't know yet and, and how much oh. he needs to learn and how much better he could be doing because he's worked in so many other aspects of, of making things that are shot by camera, not just films. So um, yeah, that that's when you have that sort of reverence for the process, because you know exactly what goes into it and what other people who are better than you are doing, uh, it puts you in a good position to recognize what you can learn from other people. Let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, we, we've spoke at nauseum now about, everything but hold the dark and like i said at the top of the episode ian this was this is you your uh princess and i i feel like it would be a game of thrones spoiler oh no i don't want to i don't want to really get into any spoilers <laughs> for, for this film at all uh no because... i said I, the fact that there's twins fucking each other and there's oh. <laughs> other, it feels like a game of thrones Damn spoiler. It. it's it's the it's starks and lannisters all in one how could you not love that right i think winter is coming and so is my works. sister <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> I don't know. Cersei likes to be choked in a hot tub. It's weird. I mean, who doesn't? Like, no <laughs> if anybody's worried about spoilers, um, I, I think Hold the Dark almost works a little better if you know more going in, I think. I don't think I agree with you. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a confusing movie. He likes to reveal things and like leave a lot ambiguous, but like... It's uh, confusing. Yeah. So Hold the Dark is his, on IMDb at least, I haven't checked all the sites, but it's his lowest rated movie by a significant margin. Um, it's definitely a movie that I've gone on a, quite a journey with. Because I think while I watched it for the first time, I was into it. I mean, part of it was I was already Jeremy Saulnier, Mark, at the time. Sure. And there was definitely some things I didn't understand while I was watching it. But I was in for the journey. The mystery was interesting to me. I was, I was looking forward to how it paid off. I was, I, I, I had the expectation that it was all going to come to some sort of ending. That even if it wasn't large and cinematic and exciting, would at least clear some things up. And then when it ended, and I was like, "What?" I, I, I think that took me away from the movie a little bit. I didn't love it, but it's definitely a movie that you keep thinking about and you revisit and maybe you check out the audio book, which is something that I did and you watch it again and you pick up a little bit more the next time around. And, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't have the patience for that. Just like, what the fuck was this movie? I don't care. Fuck it. Two out of 10 on IMDb. I'm going to give it and fuck off. And I get that. Like, I'm not going to try and talk that person into thinking this is a good movie. Cause I'm not going to be able to, Ultimately, I think I like the movie, uh, but I've had 
to give it a lot of thought to get there, I think, because they leave a lot of ambiguous and not always in a good way. I don't think. Uh, I, I think this is his lady in the water and I loved it. <laughs> Ooh, that's not fair. Yeah, but that's you love lady fair. in the water. I know that's what I'm saying. I, I thought it was, I thought it was, he got so, uh, he didn't write it. Make, make and Blair wrote it. They wrote the well, screenplay. Make and Blair adapted a novel. Adapted the novel. Yes. Um, but you know, it's, it, it it's only has... his first adaptation. It's his first sure, script sure, that he's course. directed that he didn't write. He's gonna call his his his, his buddy to to help him out, and, and I think it it turned out really well. But I just think that it was such a departure from what we're used to, and, and it's still like there's so much to love about this film. One of the best yeah. action scenes I've seen in years. I mean, name name a, a better yes. action scene that you've seen in the last five years. Maybe besides like you know, like Mad Max Fury Road. There's there's some you know uh, masterpiece. I will, I will take Chian's standoff yeah. over all of John Wick any day. Personally, I realize I'm probably way in the minority on that opinion, but that was pretty. Well, the great. fact that all the cops were shitting themselves was great. Only yeah. one of the guys kept his cool, you know. Yeah, uh, I I, th I I felt like. That was a little bit more authentic, and I feel like people that have been in firefights have said that that felt, you know, the way Especially the way he given, shot it and the way he like scripted it. Mm -hmm. Especially given that wasn't exactly SEAL Team Six pulling up on. That was a bunch uh, of Alaska cops that are used to like pulling over drunks and like I'll follow you home. It was like yeah. it was like transporting your own for. I think that was a love letter to yeah. Fargo. It felt like the Fargo cops in a fucking real life gunfight. Yeah, when they got like yeah. revolvers, they've never fired. And a dude yeah. pulls out a belt-fed, you know, saw and yeah. starts pointing it at him. Like Margie just got eggs made for her, don't you know? And now she's in a gunfight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that useful to you? Oh, you betcha. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Six uh, months pregnant, trying yeah. to crawl under a squad car. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? Margie's fucking plastered on the snow now. It was just it's so. So brutal and everything that like, cause I'll be honest, like, you know, watching the beginning and I'm just like, wow, this is, I, I'm really into this, but it's, it's very different. It's very weird. And then that's when it, I was like, I'm watching a Jeremy Saulnier film. Uh, as soon as that, you know, the, the kind of that level of, of violence and everything, but it, it's not just the violence. Like he's shown us violence before, but he's never shown us that high level of choreographed action before. And and like I said, I mean, I, I, I could definitely tell uh, there was, there was uh, influence from Coen brothers and Michael Mann. Michael, like it felt like the bank scene in heat. And I was just, ju I was just, yeah, but control. if it were set in Fargo, yeah, that's yeah, exactly. And, uh, and yet even like, so even somebody, even somebody that wasn't a, an inept buffoon who was totally inadequate and like unex not experienced, like Jeffrey Wright's character in that movie, mm -hmm. he ate shit, fell down a hill, dropped his gun when confronted <laughs> by all those wolves. Like he, right. like that, that felt authentic. I want to talk to me. About like that even thing. somebody that was a like a, a, an experienced tracker, you know, mm -hmm. could make a mistake like that. Just being so in awe of that confluence of wolves and how scary that that was. Like even somebody who's experienced and was out there to kill a wolf, you know could be in that situation and be that and uh that throne i definitely want to get into that scene because as i hinted at before i did listen to the audio book for hold the dark by uh mr giraldi um did either of you guys happen to either read or listen to that book no no experience with it mm -mm. so we didn't have six scene... months to prep for this episode <laughs> fair enough fair <laughs> enough that scene in particular to me if, if, if there's anybody watching this or listening to this on the podcast version that liked Jeremy Saulnier movies, but for whatever reason, couldn't connect to hold the dark, I would actually suggest checking out the book. Cause that was a, a, that scene in particular to me, the book added so much more context to that scene that the movie just didn't quite capture. So yeah. falls down the, the hill and he he's confronted by the wolves and he faces off against them. There's a lot that you don't, that you may interpret from that scene, but I just don't think comes clear because um, it's just, it's difficult to adapt certain things from a book into a movie sure. where you can have an internal monologue 
in a book, but that, you know, they used to do all the time in movies, but it just doesn't work cinematically. So they don't, they try to do it more visually. And it sometimes works when you're writing a script, you can make it work, but when you're trying to adapt the book, it doesn't always. And Jeffrey so Wright's one of the better actors that, you know, he's yeah. used to working mm-hmm. with. Yeah. That was one of the most important scenes in the book to understanding the themes and the, mo- and only listening to it afterward. Did that make sense to me? Cause in the movie, I just don't think it played. So when he goes into that scene, when he sets out on that hunt, looking for the wolf that killed, um, what's her name? Bailey. Uh, Medora, Medora Sloan's son, Bailey. Yeah. He sets out, he, he, he's kind of thinking, I'm going to just find a sick wolf and kill it and drag it back to make this lady mm. feel better because he respects wolves. That is an important aspect to his character. He respects wolves. He understands the the natural order of things and what happens when they're starving. And while he certainly has compassion for this woman, he doesn't necessarily think the wolf did something wrong. So he's like, I'm going to find a sick one. I'm going to kill it. It'll make her feel better. It'll be fine. The wolf was going to die anyway. But when he gets out there, he kind of starts contemplating his own motives in a way that I think the movie doesn't land for some people because they don't understand character motives, which is kind of a feature of Jeremy Saulnier movies in general, that he doesn't tell you what character motives are. But when the movies are tight and compact and claustrophobic it's so obvious you can figure it out but this movie it has a larger cast and it has it's a much broader scope of story it it, it, it was written like a book where like oh here's a pov character here's Mm -hmm. a pov character here's a pov character you don't you can't really do that as much in a movie but he definitely starts contemplating while he's staring down those wolves and watching them and then you know confronting them he contemplates is this the reason i came out here because they they appear to be ready to attack him and he only barely staves off that potentiality. And he realized, did I come out here because I'm looking for effectively suicide by wolves? Hmm. Was I looking to be taken down by these wolves? Is that what? Because otherwise you're like, why the fuck does um, Russell Core come out to this Alaska based on this letter? Like it's, it makes no sense. And in the movie, it doesn't entirely come across. It mostly works, but not quite. And he, he and, and he contemplates that, and that comes back around in the end. You know, not to get too into spoilers at the moment, but it comes well, back I around mean, in the end when he faces off against wolves again, and he he comes to peace with that. I I'm kind of okay with death by wolf. Like I'm I'm comfortable with that. <clears throat> and then only after that situation resolves, and he's going to survive and walk away from those wolves, does he realize. That you know, he's just going to tell her. You know what? I scattered those wolves to the west by pointing my gun at them, and um, what's done cannot be undone. So fucking chill, lady. And like, there, there's so much depth to that scene that you just can't tell visually. So I think that's where that scene doesn't work as well as it does in the novel. And it seems like kind of a pivotal scene that like you you almost can't do with like without voiceover or something like that. It, yeah, it feels like this might not have been the best choice. For film to adapt, and I, I think he's glad for the experience, mm-hmm. you know. But mm-hmm. I, it just it it doesn't work as a Sonya film per se. Yeah, and since since I've already brought up the novel so much, I should mention that the novel is very close. The movie's very close to the novel. I would actually compare it to two different Chuck Palahniuk mm. um, adaptations, where Fight Club was a very faithful adaptation of the the Chuck Mm -hmm. Palahniuk novel and was very well received and choke was also an ex just as equally faithful an adaptation of the novel and yet was panned fucking terrible. Yeah. I hate, I love that book and I hated that movie. You didn't like like... line for line accurate. (laughs) So it's kind of the same. Sam Rockwell was so good. Like why? I love that. Sam Rockwell is a great actor, but that he was a bad choice for that character. Well, that's another point that I wanted to bring up because during one of the, the interviews, Jeffrey Wright said that his portrayal of the character of core in the book was very, against the the casting was was, uh, and having not read the novel is that so or was it pretty close um i don't feel strongly either way on that point actually um i don't think it was bad he's having such a good decade yeah he is but i to, to 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 finish my thought um i think hold the dark falls 
squarely in the middle of those two extremes between Fight Club and Choke, where there's some things that really worked, and there's some things that maybe didn't work as well as they did in the novel. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I didn't, I don't love his casting in that role, but I also don't hate it. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a response to who would have been better. Well, let, let's think about the things that did work. I think everything with uh, uh, the, the, the father, what is it? Uh, Vincent or uh, Vernon Vernon. I think everything with Vernon, that kind of, almost like Jason Voorhees esque kind of run that he's on. I think everything worked as a Sonya film. I think the movie to whatever degree, and again, I mostly like this movie, but I think to whatever degree it, it fell apart and didn't match the novel is with the Vernon stuff more than it's with the Russell core stuff, because I think this as the book as written, it kind of has the dual protagonists of Russell core and Vernon Sloan. Uh, and Vernon Sloan is much less well um, constructed a character in this movie than he was in the book. Arsgard can't act. <laughs> I, I would actually say it was writing more than he's acting. just hot for a living. He's just fuckable. <laughs> like that's why he gets cast and stuff. He's like, do you know my father? <laughs> How about my brother? My brother can act, but me, I just look hot. The first episode of True Blood he was on, like the whole thing was like, people want to fuck this guy for some reason. And he just looked at the camera and I was like, I get that. <laughs> I'm not gay, but I get that. Sure. And then you're like, oh, he can't act. Like later, like you have to act now. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> My I father think, can I act. Think, I he was menacing in this film. I, I think he worked. I thought his character was one of the the standouts, at least for me. As far see, <laughs> and you might be judging it in comparison to the, to the novel, where I'm just judging it strictly. Does this work yeah. as a Sonya film? And I think that those the kind of the brutal moments, uh, those are the ones that that worked for me. Yeah. I already see more so than any other character in yeah. any other Jeremy Sonier film. I felt like he was just indestructible, which that itself was polarizing and and jarring to me. Cuz of the cuz of the mysticism. You wonder, oh is he really like does he have is he a wolf spirit? The same thing with the sister. Yeah. You know. Yeah. The, the sister think, wife. You wonder think, like are they re are they doing like this elaborate ritual or are they just goofing around with stuff they don't understand? Like it's the book probably explains that better than the movie did. Well, I can't no, believe no one got not. what what it was going for. Like it beat you over the head. And even Jeremy Sonny no. in interviews is like, I wasn't gonna put that big moment like of exposition or this is what we mean at the end. He's like, if you just watch the film, you'll get it. Everything is in there. The whole story. You gotta watch there. it twice. If you watch it twice, you get yeah. it. Because you watch yeah. it the second time, she's like, oh, we didn't meet. I know in my whole life. I was like, right. ah. I got this there the whole time. <laughs> if anybody, if anybody watched this movie once and didn't like it and saw no reason to return to it, they're they're probably right. They probably weren't going to get something more out of it the second time. I got quite a bit more out of it the second time, personally. Um, but you have to have the patience for it for sure. But I think going back, do you to, think that Sony I has think, the gravitas to expect somebody to to give him that much latitude? I don't, I don't think he necessarily has. Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to your like, question. Do you think you do something that ambitious where it's like, yeah, if you didn't get it, just watch it again when you've only done two good movies? I, I think I he did that with this film. Absolutely, he I, did that with this I, film. I don't know. In terms of choosing this movie as an adaptation, I don't know how much it was his choice versus Macon's choice versus Netflix's choice, but I, it might not have been the best choice of novel to try and adapt. Cause I think, especially I was talking about that Vernon Sloan character was the one that didn't translate the best. I yeah. think his character was also probably the most challenging to adapt because his character was so contemplative and so driven by the inner monologue. I know I talked more about yeah. um, Russell Corr's inner monologue in that one scene, but um, almost all of Vernon Sloan's characters developed through inner monologue. So it, I mean, it's not necessarily an Alexander Skarsgård issue, as you implied. Um, but it's I not, just, not I, either. I, I just like like randomly yeah. shitting on people who and I, never know. My, my, fir my, <laughs> my first instinct when you said that was to say it's more of a writing error than an acting error. But then I'm also thinking, like, man, Macon Blair doesn't suck. I don't, though. I don't know. I don't know. No, he doesn't. And I don't know how you write that character if you're trying to adapt this novel into a, a into a movie because it's. It is. It's. It's an incredible challenge, and I don't think they nailed it. But I also don't know how you. Nailed well, it. for Macon Blair's first yeah. adaptation, 
and yeah. Sony's yeah. first yeah. adaptation. Like it, it, it's a challenging piece of work and like maybe it didn't work, but like, so what? I think they'll probably make good movies again. Yeah, it sure. was dense and it was, and it was definitely a, a step up uh, of challenging themselves, which I, you know, I, like I said, I think that the stuff that worked in there is uh very resonant and i'll think and i still th- i'm still thinking about the film uh, and, and you even said yeah. six months after you saw it initially you're still thinking about the film mm-hmm. but let's try to put macon blair in a in a jar and talk about him and his one film because he did not unlike jeremy well, i think Sonier, the best way to talk about that is sort of contrast it with how jeremy sonia would have made the same movie okay yeah but I mean, it's, it's worth it's noting like they, that he didn't use him at all. Where Jeremy Sonia uses Macon in in some kind of facet or another, even in uh, Hold the Dark, he still uh, kind of shoehorned his buddy in there. Uh, where you don't see anything, he's not even the the key grip. Uh, in I don't feel well, at home I kind of feel anymore. like they were these these movies sort of overlapped a little bit because I feel like it took so much longer to make Hold the Dark. Sure, that like he probably already got started. I don't feel at home, and I. I think if they hadn't gotten Sundance, they might not have released until like maybe last year, okay. which is when Hold the Dark came out versus I feel like they caught a lucky break and God, the, the movie won Sundance, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, such a, uh, a, a good first effort, you know, from a, a guy who's made movies before, but like, I feel like, I don't know. He just, he made good choices. I feel like in, I, I you know, I, I said before, Murder Party is a good starting point where you see Sonya sort of deviate into the more serious stuff and make and sort of go toward the more, it should have a comedic bent. And when you have the violence be cartoonish, you sort of have to have the people who get hurt deserve it. But at the same time, you know, like, it can be a relief of the tension where you can use the violence to punctuate, you know, tense scenes, but still have it just sort of be like, Oh, this was the whole th- movie was crazy versus, you know, you almost had to have a little tension relief because green room was just so tense mm-hmm. that I, I, I kind of feel like they're diverging a little bit. And if they make movies independent of each other, they're going to be, you know, making Blair's going to continue to make movies in that kind of comedic, violent vein and Sony is going to get more serious or at least stay on the track he's on. And uh, I don't hate that because they're making two different kinds of movies that I I like. I like both. I thought Elijah Wood was probably the only person that could have played that role. I really liked him. And so with uh, Linsky talked about Elijah Wood yet. Linsky was fantastic as well. She was everybody was great in that movie. A guy from uh, Malcolm in the middle was great in that movie too. I'm the the detective. Mm-hmm. The detective, yeah, he lost. Uh, um, he lost some weight. Since about, well, that guy has always yeah. done comedy, so I liked him being in his uh-huh. it, Gary Anthony Williams. I no one cares about your Silva. Yeah, because yeah. he he we, he did he, he, he did comedy. You know, he was a Malcolm in the Middle, but he did like a like a mm. sketch comedy show that made it like one season on Fox. Yeah. Like I, I feel like if I looked into him, he's like, oh, he was at the Groundlings, or he was at like Second City, or something. It wouldn't surprise me, but like getting a lot more people that did a little bit more comedy to right. do serious roles. Like, I don't know, like casting uh, like a shitload of comedians in the informant, stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. I, I think, uh, I think that almost makes the tone a little bit more jovial. That movie is so much fun. And Elijah Wood's character, like Melanie Linsky was He's such an idiot. Boy. I love it. Yeah, Melanie Linsky is great in that movie, and yet somehow Elijah Wood steals every scene he's in. Just the absurdity of everything he does. Makes me so furious. Kevin, stop it! From Because he's naming, so good. It's like his 9,000th movie. Yeah, from naming his dog, from his dog's name being Kevin. To teaching to, a Chinese, yeah. <laughs> yeah, An Jing, An Jing! Uh, to his use, <laughs> his use of the Chinese throwing stars. <laughs> to the rat tail that, that he so had. Yeah. yeah, to the <laughs> rat tail and the shitty Camaro and the... Because we've all yeah. known someone like this in, in real life. And he's and like selecting was... which useless medieval weapon to take. He's like, do I take <laughs> a the nunchucks or a morning star? <laughs> it's just like, just... <laughs> 
So yeah. just come with me and back me up, idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One one area where I know Macon Blair has gotten some grief over that movie is on the the lengthiness of that title. So while I did not mm. solve the lengthiness mm. of the title, I remember during our bad movie night review of um uh, I don't feel at home in this world anymore. I, I you don't even uh, remember the name. No. I, I proposed the alternative title of "How Elijah Wood Helped Me Get My Groove Back." <laughs> <laughs> Stella got her laptop back, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so funny because Macon Blair's laptop was stolen from his house, and he felt like so violated. And then he went to the police, and they're like, "All right, we can put that information in the report." He's like, "What the fuck? That's it." <laughs> Like how how you have to laugh at a situation like that, juxtaposed with like there's no way to laugh at what oh it was so wacky the Nazis were trying to kill us because we witnessed the murder right yeah and you, like, you kind you, of you understand just laugh at like the police just not giving a fuck about your laptop and it's so important to you like I can see it I tr yeah. I'm tracking the laptop it's at this address they're like we're not gonna send someone for your laptop idiot go buy a new laptop like. Let's talk about the action scene where she accidentally hits him in the face with the silver. The old man gently like breaks her finger in like two. Oh, he just, yeah, the, he's just like, Oh, you hit my face. And she's like, I'm sorry. And he's like, just breaks. Yeah. Instead of being like still being affronted, he, he gets all oh. aggro. Oh, and then, Elijah, and then yeah. Elijah Wood punches <laughs> out the 85 year old man. He's he gone. He he don't even know him. if he's dead or not. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They just ran. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was cartoonish. The guy's st staggering around with his throat all collapsed from getting hit with the plaster of Paris. <laughs> and you're like, wow, he could die. And it's like, oh, the bus hits him. Right. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. It, it was a Coen Brothers film. It was it was burn after reading. Yeah, it was exactly. It was that kind of silliness where the violence is just like, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. It was so Brad, Brad Pitt Pitt. shot yes! in the face right in front of you. But it's yep. like, it's so hilarious that you're not like, ah. Like if you show someone get shot in the face in a Sony movie, you're like, oh fuck! Like right. it, it, you get that gut punch, but there was no gut punch in a Macon Blair, you know, face shooting. Oh, Jane Levy's, uh, her her rifle backfiring and fucking blowing up in her, blowing was up her so hand. Fucking, yeah. yeah, Melanie Linsky like, vomiting on the floor. That was <laughs> so perfect. It was so perfect because, like, what would you do in that situation? Yeah. You wouldn't do some. John Wick shit and die behind a sofa. You fucking <laughs> what? She like, was fundamentally a good person. Yeah. She was a nurse and she was a nurse who just was a doormat because she was so nice. She wouldn't confront the guy and tell him to shut the fuck up when he spoiled yeah. was making Blair when he spoiled the end of the book for her. Let's people come in front of her in line. She's just a doormat. And so she's like, I'm sick of this shit. I'm not a doormat. Fuck you, I'm going to cut in front of you in line. I'm going to spill cereal over the parking lot. I'm going to go lie to get into this house. And they're like, so violence went down. And she's like, Bleh! because <laughs> she's a normal person. Yeah, she's and not Michael Douglas and like, falling down. I right? have changed. I'm a badass now. And it's like, yeah. no, you're fucking not. You're going to see blood and you're going to lose your shit because you're not a badass. Right. Yeah. She's not Michael Douglas and falling down. So I think. I don't feel at home in this world anymore to me is a very weird dichotomy because on the one hand, I think it might be my favorite out of all of these movies we've hmm. talked about. Wow. That's okay. hard. Yeah. And yet it also to me has the most annoying flaw to it, which is in the that, title. Well, no, <laughs> Besides the title, I'm, I'm fine with the title. I don't think like, that's a rule you can break as far as I'm concerned. I'm not. It's a nightmare. As long as it's convenient. I understand why it's problematic. Dr. Strange love or how I, Learned to love the about long titles yeah. and love long also, titles. Also a great title. <laughs> no, it, it, it deals it deals specifically with medication. So one of the things she has several things stolen from her house. She has the silver stolen, her laptop, and some medication. Uh -huh. Specifically, they do name clonazepam and Lexapro. Lexapro, yeah, antidepressants. Are, the Lexapro is an antidepressant. The clonazepam is an anti-anxiety medication, which is a benzo. Uh, a benzo for short. Sure. I'm not going to try and say the whole name, but a, a symptom of withdrawal on a benzo is hallucinations. So in there's a scene towards the end where she's a little lost and she can't find her way. And her, a vision of her grandmother who's been dead for years now mm. her in the right direction and helps her not solve the problem, but helps bring guide her, her like Yoda. Yeah. And to me, that all like, does that say that if this girl just stayed on her medication, everything would have played out fine? 
I don't know. I don't like the way that, I don't like what that says about that movie. You know, it's like a Gerald's game thing where someone gets yeah. in like a really tense situation and their <laughs> brain manifests as an external character to help them. <laughs> you cannot talk about Gerald's game. Why? Did you not like the Netflix Gerald's game? That's a I will not be watching. Movie. I will not be watching that movie. Why? Because okay, I was a very advanced reader from my age at a very young age. Yeah, so when I, I read it too. Yeah. When I finished my Goosebumps books when I was in elementary school and about, <laughs> like, what? And about, in about sixth grade, I moved on to, to Fear Street and that did not satisfy because Fear Street's novels sucked. So I moved on to Stephen King and I read Cujo first and I liked it. And I read The Stand and I liked it. And then I read Gerald's Game at about age 11. Oh. 11 year olds, 11, 11 or 12 year olds do not have That's the rough. capacity to understand what's going on in Gerald's game. And I uh, <laughs> pick it back up again, man. That. <laughs> <laughs> I played Resident Evil 2 as an 11 year old to fuck me up until I finally made myself watch The Walking Dead. Now I love zombies, but <laughs> there's no way you were 11 when Resident Evil 2 came out. I we're the same age, Jason. That was like 98. Uh, yeah. yeah. Resident Evil <laughs> 1 came out when you, you were guys, 11 or 12. You guys just made me feel old. Well. Dude, the PlayStation wasn't out when you were 11. Stop lying. Anyway. Oh, my God. All right. <laughs> Do the math. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> watch the Netflix Gerald's game. You're not 11 anymore. Oh. You'll be fine. It's good. It's and, uh Okay. Okay. I, I I'll, actually I'll like... Do you, I don't necessarily consider that a flaw. I kind of like the fact that she hallucinated as a... Uh, a symptom of benzo withdrawal although she works at a oh, hospital so there's no way she wouldn't have been able right. to get more pills so if she just took her medication this whole movie solved like i don't like that what that says about no i think i think that the the being off the medication was the clarity that she needed to put her on this weird madcap bullshit anyway because lexapro think... and clomazepam would have leveled her out to the yeah extent. she wouldn't have had she wouldn't have said fuck it she would have just stayed home and drank beers and never gone and but also her. Also, if she'd never taken that medication, she wouldn't be on withdrawal symptoms. So the only way this movie resolves is because she was on the medication and then off of them. I don't know. Dude. <laughs> I don't know. But the, I think the medication I'm, I'm shows that it. she was a kind of per, a nervous person that was just so timid. You're right. That she needed anti-anxiety medication. Because yeah, the last pros, whatever, but like yeah. anti-anxiety medication, just like being in I'll, social situations, freaked her out. It. I'll, I'll admit I, it. I'm I'm overthinking this. I've I'm not my, necessarily. You're not necessarily right. though, because like, it, no, yeah. being on those medications makes sense for her character. Don't I, get I, me I've wrong. stubbed my toe and gone to the doctors, and they prescribed me Lexapro. So you, you know, it's it, like like Jason said. Maybe it's uh, she's the type of person that, and she's a nurse, so she's like, yeah, I have access or whatever. Who knows? But, but she, uh, yeah, she does make, clearly yeah. have anxiety issues. She sure. I mean. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not prepared to be to diagnose, but right. she's at least in the ballpark of somebody who should be taking these types of things if sure. she feels she needs it. And and that's very interesting because that character is so ham handed is like, how do I show she's a nice person? She's a nurse. <laughs> Macon Blair didn't have access to a Macon Blair type. When you have Sonia, right. is like, I need Macon Blair who's got a fucking baby face. When he shaves off that big scraggly beard, he grew for like ten months. Took him that long to grow that beard. John could grow that beard tomorrow. That's right. Making Blair took 10 months to grow that beard. And he's just such a little baby face, like, oh, like a little weenie looking guy. You know, he looks so harmless. He was so fucked up by his parents getting murdered in Blue Ruin that he couldn't cope. His sister yeah. was fine. She had the same thing happen to her. She's like, oh, I got a life now. I got kids. You know, I got a nice house. I'm dealing with my shit. And he's like, ah, I got to go live in a van down by the river. Cause he I was weak, cope. like she said, and that just shows how like the same thing fucked up two different people so profoundly. Yeah. And like the sister could cope, he couldn't, and he was the kind of person that was so messed up by the situation. He's like, "Oh, he's out of prison. I have no choice but to go kill him." And Gotta the sister share. was like, "I'm glad he's dead, but I could never do that." Mm -hmm. You know, versus like making Blair sort of like, "I don't have a making Blair type to cast. How do I show this is a good soft person?" Who isn't the kind of who needs to be put in extraordinary circumstances to even like find her inner fierceness and stop taking everyone's shit, you know? So like, yeah, she's a, a nurse and a woman and she's on all these medications. It, it just it, you're right. That felt a little ham fisted. It's like, how do you how do you construct a Macon Blair type? And that's uh, that's sort of what you do.
Yeah, it was a little uh, unorganic, like like Macon is just that person for Jeremy. Yeah, but I, I I didn't I didn't hold that against the movie per se. Wrap this all up and to, and to bring these two back together. I I am like this this film was good enough uh, to win Sundance. It's good enough to uh, warrant Macon Blair getting the Toxic Avenger adaptation. That's his next film. So I mean, he's still going to be doing movies, and I think that that's the that's the correct next step for him like give him uh a verhoven esque uh kind of ip uh because i think he's gonna he's gonna run with that uh, and he's gonna make it funny he's gonna make it brutal um and uh, hopefully he'll get the right cast for it and i hope he writes it um where again i think sonia on the kind of trajectory that he's going i think he is going to be a little bit more of a serious uh filmmaker um yeah and i just I, and ian i think you you summed it up best at the at the top of this episode I, uh, you know, last, last time we talked, Jason, we talked about uh link letter and I felt very motivated and, and inspired to like, I could, you know, the, the, every man could do anything and the, every man could go make a film. And, uh, but, but then, you know, coming off that and going into watching Jeremy Saulnier and Macon Blair and, and their, uh, very kind of familiar upbringing, uh, it was just, it just blew my mind even more. So, uh, the, these two are just, I, I'm so I, I love when we talk about people that have clout like uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick and all that, but I love, I, I think we talked about Jeremy Saunier and Macon Blair at a perfect time in their career where you, we are really seeing something special. Uh, kind, kind of like a Yorgos Lanthimos where we're seeing these incredible uh, one of a kind films and, and they're just kind of uh, exploding onto the scene. And, and I couldn't be happier. We had Lanthimos <laughs> in an hour and it took us two yeah. to go over these guys. Yeah just talking about what we liked and what we didn't like about what they did. And uh, I just want to see Fair enough. I, I can't wait till, till making Blair gets like his second or third movie. If he feels like directing again, no, he's doing the thing about Toxic Netflix. Avenger. It's, doing, it's so doing good. Toxic and, like, Avenger. Did, oh yeah. That's, that's right. He's inside on to the, Oh, that'll be so good. Yeah. Um, but like uh, the thing about Netflix is it's such a good distribution method for, for a movie where you don't want to be like, all right, we'll market this, but like this movie has to make $87 million or it's a failure. Cause we're going to spend $57 million marketing it. Like yeah, you just, fair enough. The movie theaters, they're only showing like the Marvel movies. Everyone's like, well, why is that? Well, because you have if to advertise the shit out of it to get people to get off their couch where they have Netflix and they have the Disney streaming channel and they have, you know, YouTube and they have Hulu and all that crap. To get someone into a theater, it has to matter. Yeah. You know, if I couldn't see a movie for five dollars during the day and take my daughter for free, I wouldn't have seen fucking Missing Link, right? Mm. But it was great. But like that kind of movie is just it's in such a bad spot where it's like, well, we have to advertise the missing link before every movie PG thirteen or lower for six months to make our money back. Yeah. You know, even though we just made Kubo for Christ's sake, and that movie was amazing. I think uh, one of the most it's tough where Netflix is just sort of like, yeah, we'll buy your movie. I think one of the most frustrating opinions that I hear on the regular is people are like, oh, they don't make any good movies anymore. It's all reboots and remakes and sequels. Uh, there's nothing good. I'm like, no. I mean, there's so many more movies made in 2019 than there were in 2009. In 1999, it's exponentially more movies. If you're prepared yep. to find the movies that match your sensibilities, you can find it. Now, it does take a little bit more work because there's so much, and I I respect the difficulty that that presents to some people. And hey, Marvel makes great movies. I like those movies too, and I've liked most of the recent Star Wars movies as well. They're fun in a different way. I get a lot. I get something different out of the Last Jedi than I get out of Hold the Dark. Uh, but there's lots of great original movies happening and I love that Netflix is able to make, and I don't feel at home in this world anymore accessible to so many people. And I hope people are picking up on that. Um, this would have been in 11 theaters. It would have won Sundance. It would have been in 11 goddamn theaters. And I would have had to drive like, two hours to Ann Arbor to see this. If I wanted to see it at all, like blue ruin, that was yeah. what was, that's what happened with blue ruin back mm -hmm. in the day. And I guarantee you, like I went and I was talking with my coworkers today and in the last few days about Green Room. Almost none of them. I, I don't think I have a single coworker who's seen Green Room. And I, I don't work in a big company. There's like 10 other people there. 
and all of them are into punk music and all of them are have political opinions that are probably antithetical to Nazis. And like I have several coworkers who I think would love Green Room and none of them have seen it. And that is probably Jeremy Saulnier's most accessible and most accepted film. It's his biggest film, yeah. Yeah, I mean probably That's your goddamn probably Stewart by more read people. the script and had to make it. Yeah, right, and, right. and Anton Yelchin was it was his last movie that was released before his death. Not the last one he filmed, not the last one released, but the last one before his death. Yeah. And yet so still so few people have seen it. Um and people and and there was that was the same year that um uh was the first Star Wars movie that came out under Disney. Um I'm too drunk, I'm not remembering titles. Uh Return of the Force. I keep saying a new hope, but I know it's wrong. Rise of the Return Jedi of the Force. Walker stars. <laughs> Beetle Jason. That was the same. That was the same year that the first Ray and Finn it was JJ. It was the JJ Abrams the first, one, not the, the Raheem yeah. Johnson one. Yeah, Star Trek. Not Raheem Johnson. Yeah. No, it was the first JJ Abrams movie, and yet people, oh, there's nothing good coming out. Fucking Green Room came out. Shut up, people. <laughs> but nobody's seen it, so I hope people find the opportunity to find out about Jeremy Saulnier movies and other people like that. Well, we, we've been talking so much uh, about even the past couple episodes about the state of the industry and, and where it's going and, and the fact that you don't need to see you don't even need to see th these kind of films in, in theaters anymore. But, you know, what, what you're going to see is, is fantastic stuff on Netflix and Amazon Prime. And these are the type of filmmakers that you want kind of heading that movement. You want your Jeremy Saunier's, you want your Macon Blair's, uh, you want your Alex Garland's, uh, you want these people in power to make uh, these films on this new platform because they're willing to do it. They're hungry to do it. They'll do it on a budget. I mean, I, I love the fact that Jeremy Saunier felt uncomfortable that that green room got to a place budget wise where he didn't feel comfortable that if the crew needed something, he could just pull out his, his American express and buy it himself. Like he felt, felt bad about that because that's the type of care and, and love and attention and passion that you want to kind of drive us into this new Napster for movies type and era. Uh, but yeah, Can you imagine if Kevin Smith never got more money than he got to make clerks, how many sure. good fucking movies he would have made instead of what he actually did make. <laughs> Can you imagine if he had to go every single time he wanted to make a movie, he had to work at the quick stop for six months and lie and say he was the manager and like max out credit cards to buy black and white film stock. Can you imagine Kevin Smith might have made a second good movie if he'd had to do what Jeremy Sony had to do to get uh, more ruin made? Just Ian's been ribbing Jason all all cast, and this is all of the uh, the payback, right? They want. <laughs> Shitting on his favorite filmmaker. Uh, <laughs> well, with that said, uh, Clerks is in my top ten movies, so yeah, the man has film. merit. I love Mallrats. Uh, is is Yoga Hosers? <sighs> oh, look! This guy implies I saw Yoga Hosers. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Tusk. Yoga Hosers. I saw Tusk in the theater. I was Oof. like, "Oh, I get it. Tusk was a joke, and the I? joke was on me for paying to see it. I get it." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're too cynical. Uh, no, they literally said at the end of the movie, "Is like ah, it was it was the gotcha." The, when they played the voiceover from the Smodcast, where they came up with the concept of the movie, and they were just high and laughing, like ah, <laughs> what if we made this movie? And then I was like, "Oh no, <laughs> he got me. I yeah. encouraged him." <laughs> Jason, please don't see Yoga Hosers. I don't want to hear your opinion. <laughs> now we have I don't to watch see Yoga Hosers, so I'll yeah, just no. watch Clerks again and be like, I'm so glad I'm not watching Clerks 2 right now. <laughs> let me let me say this. I I can't wait to show my daughter Yoga Hosers. She's not ready for it. She's seven and she's terrified by everything. Um, but when she's ready, it's it's gonna be she's gonna love it. Well, uh, we'll have it to do a follow-up. We'll, we'll have to do a follow-up cast on that, like we did with Hold the Dark. It, it might not be for you know men in their thirties, and that's fine. <laughs> oh, so it's Jersey Girl. It's not for me. No. Oh. Well, that's our show for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I There's like a Kevin Jersey Smith Girl. quote. I got him in a holster. <laughs> I, I like I like Jersey Girl. Uh, Ian, where can everyone find you? You're you're from Bad Movie Night. Most of the time, I'm from I'm from Bad Movie Night. You can follow Bad Movie Night on Twitter, on Reddit, all the places. Check out us. Check us out on YouTube or our podcast. 
Um, we're getting, we're dabbling in a little bit of short filmmaking ourselves. Oh, you can check out uh, bmnfilms.com. We've got uh, a trailer out for Memory Leak, which will be hitting the f- local festival scene soon. I watched it, and we've got a new podcast slash video show coming soon, which I think you might be one of about five people that know about, John. Sweet. We've got Crite Night coming. Where we're taking uh, the Critters franchise one minute at a time. Oh, <laughs> that's awesome! So if you like, if you like Critters, and who doesn't? If you don't like Critters, go fuck yourself. <laughs> yeah, we we could come together. You know the the anti Kevin Smith. <laughs> yeah, Jason, you've never said anything I've agreed with more. <laughs> critters, critters is one of my favorite franchises of all time. Yeah. Well, thank you for for choosing our platform to spoil that fun project. So look forward to that. Jason, where can everyone find you, sir? I'm on Twitter at Jason E. Alt. Uh, I have a pinned post at the top of my Twitter profile that says all the other stuff I'm involved in. I write articles. I do podcasts. I'm a a person that generates content. I do stand-up comedy. That's not on Twitter. You'll have to see me live if you want to see me do some stand-up comedy. But hey... I do this podcast every other week. It's a good time. And uh, just check me out on Twitter. Don't look for me elsewhere. Or I might not stand by the stuff I say on Reddit, per se. So thank you so much for tuning in. What were we going to say? The problem with seeing your stand-up is I'd have to go to Michigan, wouldn't I? I mean, you should be so lucky. Just keep going. Just keep going. Uh... I don't where's, think that's going to happen. Where's the mute button? You can find me on this very <laughs> channel. They said, we said, doing this show every other week, as Jason stated. Director's Cut, it's a good time. Had by all. You could also listen to it on all the, uh, what are they called? The podcasting websites, the iTunes, your Spotify's, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, iHeartRadio, it's even on. Ooh. Uh, we are on the iHeartRadio Podcasting Network. We are. We are. Uh, I just want to say that. I, I felt so like a real podcaster there for a second. I almost want to plug Blue Apron. <laughs> <laughs> Go to MeUndies.com and get your cherry berries. <laughs> Why do I know what that means, too? I hate that I got that reference. You share an interesting connection that is related to the topic of our subject tonight. Because I am in Pennsylvania. John, you are in Washington. And Jason, you are in Michigan. These are all three states that are very, probably not underrated, but very high on the list of white nationalism. Oh. Much like Green Room. That's true. Uh, Pennsylvania, you, Pennsylvania is low key, like the center of the KKK. I thought mine was more in Oregon, though. Green yeah. was in Oregon. Green yeah. was Western, in Oregon, but Washington's got Western Washington gets really dicey. Uh, Eastern Washington. I'm sorry, I said that. Yeah, wrong. I'm in, I'm in Western where everyone's just smoking pot yeah. all the time. The, yeah, people are too lazy here to. You're near, you're near Seattle, but once you get over the, the once you get over those mountains, it gets real dicey. Yeah. <laughs> See, I, I've lived in Lancaster, California, so I have no aspirations to go back into Spokane. So uh, we'll see you at the movies, or we'll see you on Netflix, or or we'll see all- you in Lancaster. 